scientific evidence does not support the existence of God, nor is there any evidence in history for the existence of God. So draw your own conclusions. Are you teaching us in this class that God does not exist? Mr. Agar, as a historian, how can I have respect for history's greatest phantom? does and not exist. Communicating He's his nothing more than a creation of people like you and I. Wow. That sounds good. Or could I have thought of that to be in class? He violated her. He violated her relationship our family, with our God. And he violated her right to believe. The sad part about it is, he doesn't even know it. This God, God to be him what he's done so let him know what he's taken from her you always tell me no you did daddy daddy i want to tell him no i want to tell him wait a minute what is so important that both of y'all want to tell me mom said dinner's ready and right. that you have to come downstairs so we can pray all right tell your mother i'll be downstairs in a minute okay got it all right Hey, be careful. That's it. He broke her sacred bond. By teaching her to have contempt for God and religion, the professor broke that young girl's sacred bond with her family. Tell the professor how he's violated the student. But show him. <laughs> Woo! I'm gonna write a book. Okay, cowboy. Are you gonna say the blessing? I'm going to make a film out of this story. I mean, we can show the world how our religious rights are being violated. Mom, where's the butter? Hold on one second, baby. Oh, it can teach students, teachers, and parents. If done right, this could be the next great revival in the Christian world. See, Professor Burns is only aware of his own agenda, which is to communicate his hurt and anger toward God. But he is unaware of the hurt he's caused in return. The, the young girl who uh, is in the class, the one who raised her hand in class today, the one who no longer believes, she is the focal point. Show people her life before she entered his class. Show them the treasured memories of a parent and child and the joy that family shared before he entered her life. Then show them how that joy was destroyed. There are many victims like her out there. Students who have their fate stripped away from them. 
that stories go unnoticed. But I, I hear from heaven. Give her a name. Tell her story. That way you teach both student and teacher. All my children have a right to learn. But they also have a right to believe. Here you go, sweetheart. Don't worry, Dad. I'll pray for dinner. And I'll pray for you. The Miss Education. The Miss Education of. Her name will be Joy. really great yes. yeah it's a uh, it's been a really long road uh, remission has been our favorite word right there next to hope the fact that she's been with us this long is just it's only a lesson you know i never told you this but when we started lessons i didn't even know i was i was wondering if she'd even finished them we got it we got it what are you girls talking about joy taught us sign in sunday school and, and we wanted to show her okay oh. she went that way wait we can show you too okay okay <laughs> it means with my last breath, one more soul will find their way. Oh, that's beautiful. My that's little true. evangelist. <laughs> with my last breath, one more soul will find its way. <laughs> Did you open it? <laughs> no, I mean, it came in the mail yesterday. I, I was too scared, but I yeah. didn't even tell my parents. What? <laughs> well, it's like, what if I don't even get in? I mean... Lots of colleges are just too far away, and this one's close by. Okay, on three then. Are you gonna open that letter or not? You open it. Okay. Come on, open it already. Dear Miss Hunter, after a careful review of your application to attend our prestigious college, we regret to inform you that you will be spending the next four years in college with your two crazy friends. <laughs> <men. laughs> You've been accepted. <laughs> oh, I cannot wait to be a Christian counselor. I, I just want to share Jesus with anyone I can, everyone. Joy, you sound so corny. <laughs> just a minute ago, you didn't even think you were getting in. God has just been so good to me, and I just want everyone to know it. I want everyone to know him. Just think about it, an elementary teacher, a veterinarian. College, this is gonna be an amazing experience for all of us. That's for sure. And the doctor said it wouldn't be, but I'm still here. You're still here. Uh-huh. <laughs> We're going to college. We're going to college. <laughs> <laughs> I need to tell my parents. I need to tell my parents. Go, go, go. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Pastor Troy. Your worship is amazing. You all sounded so beautiful this morning. Amen? Amen. All right. You know, today is a, it's a bittersweet day. Bitter because three of our members will be leaving us. Sweet because they'll be going off to college. You know, nothing pleases me more than to see and recognize when our young uh, today, they excel not only spiritually, but academically as well. Joy Hunter, Nancy Remington, and Sam Hayes, can you please stand? Let's give them a hand, shall we? No, 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 don't, don't sit down, don't sit down. Now, I remember these three uh, when they were in, uh, back in the nursery here at church, uh, when I used to run that back in that time, and uh, they were at every one of our summer camps junior high and high school ministries as well, loving and supporting one another as friends do. I'm gonna miss that, I really am. And two of the three of them uh, for the past five years served in our children's ministry, teaching our young. We're all gonna miss that. But now they're gonna be busy doing reports and projects and homework. Well, I hope they are, right? And um, we know that occasionally they're gonna be coming through on Sundays, but now they're charted to change the world, change the world for the better, just as they've changed our world for the better. What's up, big girl? Why do people have to suffer? I know that God cares for us and everything. I know that, but I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of the medication, the side effects. I'm tired of doctor's offices and hospital visits. I, I missed 20 days last year. I don't want to miss one day of college. I don't. Okay. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Sometimes there are questions that don't have answers. When but we, I just... I know, hold on. When we want them, because God knows that we're just not ready for it just yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah it does. Okay. So why don't, we, why don't we go and have lunch, and then when you get your answer, I'll be right here for you, and we can talk about it then. Yes, okay. okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is filled with death, destruction, disease, suffering, and cruelty. History proves it. Welcome to college. I am Professor Burns, and this is History 110, Ancient Civilizations. Oh yes, I probably should get something out of the way before we, we move on to anything else. The way we're going to date events in this course We'll be using the convention BCE and CE. Uh, does anybody know what? That's uh, before Common Era and Common Era. That's right. That's exactly right. Whatever happened to BC and AD? Well, I don't like them. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, uh, they kind of give the impression that uh, there are a heck of a lot more Christians on campus than there actually are. Now, I do recognize that many of you have been raised with a religious vocabulary that still creeps into our secular vernacular, uh, and I promise I won't hold that against you. 
However, we will be talking about a great number of things in this course, uh, many of them controversial. I mean, we are talking about civilization, so we are going to be talking about politics, uh, music, uh, uh, racism, sexism, and as you probably guessed, we'll be talking about one of my favorites, uh, religion. And in fact, we're going to be hitting uh, a number of religions. Uh, there's going to be offense taken. In fact, let's go ahead and uh, see if we can offend someone right now. Uh, can anybody tell me the name of the world's largest religion? Let me give you a hint. It was started uh, by a Persian cult over 3,000 years ago. Professor, are you talking about Islam? No, that actually is second, uh, with about one billion members. So then who's number one? Actually, Christianity is number one. Two billion followers. And it was started by an ancient Persian cult about 3,000 years ago called Zoroastrianism. So you're saying that Christianity is a cult? I thought it was supposed to be the only way to God. It is. Well... There are actually many religions that claim they are the way. Uh, Christianity is just one of many. It's uh, referred to as exclusivity. Okay? The, uh, the point being, Christians believe that they are following the practices of Jesus when they're actually following the practice of Zoroaster, who the religion is named after. Personally, I think it's fairly arrogant for Christians to feel that they've got a monopoly on truth. But when people follow religion, they oftentimes understand it more with their heart than with their head. Professor, that's not true. Oh, uh, are you offended? No, but I do find you offensive. Well, the truth is often offensive. Yes, Professor, but so is a lie. What's your name? Paul Agard. Paul, the Apostle Paul. Uh, so <laughs> I take it that uh, you're a Christian, Paul. Yes, I am. And despite the sacrilegious laughter in this classroom, according to your figures on Christianity, I'm not the only one. Chill out, man. It's just a course. You're wrong. It's not just a course. And we need to have a degree of respect for God, even when discussing him in a history class. Yes. Professor, I think he has a point. I took ancient <laughs> history in high school, and we never spoke about God like this. And what's your name? Joy Hunter. Joy, well, newsflash, uh, we're not in high school anymore. And you're probably going to see quite a number of differences before too long. Now, enough of this, please. We're going to have plenty of time to discuss the mysteries and myths of Christianity later on the semester. Uh, for now, believe me, I'm an equal opportunity offender. There will be plenty of offenses to go around. Uh, I just want to add, Paul, uh, you will help me make my point in this class. Now, with the remaining time, if I could ask uh, each one of you to... Say your name, and if there's any reason left why you're taking this course. Uh, I'm Frank Johnson. My mom told me to either go to college or get a job, so here I am. <laughs> to be honest, I just took the course because I needed the credits, but I've learned more about Christianity today than I have in my entire life. I'm going to hand it to you, Professor. You really know your stuff. You got me interested. I'm looking to see how all this religion stuff got started. I always knew it was a bunch of bunk. This didn't make sense. How could one come back from the dead? You know, I, I didn't expect to start a fan club this early on, but thank you very much. Uh, like I said, we will be talking about Christianity uh, later in the course. And when we do, I think one of the things you'll see is that there's actually very little evidence that demonstrates that Jesus even existed. My God, I mean, did I sign up for a history class or atheism 101? <laughs> Calm down, man. Mr. Agard, the fact that you're on that side of the desk and... I'm on this side of the desk, might indicate to you that I probably know a bit more about history than you do. Yes, well, at what time in this class do you plan on teaching it? Well, what is your major, Mr. Agard? Education. 
Great. Uh, and what do you plan on doing with that? I want to be a history teacher. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, um, let me suggest that you get a second opinion on that. And what gives you the right to say that to me? Who are you to make that judgment call? History is a matter of knowing and explaining facts from the past. And there's more evidence for the existence of Jesus than there is for the non-existence of him. Mr. Agard, I, I really don't want to talk about it. You've already taken up enough time in our class. Next. Um, after college, I'd like to be a Christian. I'd like to be a counselor, and I'm just taking this class for the credits. Well, you've picked a, a noble profession. I'm sure you've got a lot of people at home that are very proud of you. Anybody else? What we need is a new science curriculum in our schools. That's what I would petition this college to establish. New science curriculum? Yep. Hank. The age of Bible ethics and traditional Christian values is over. We are now a secular nation. Yeah, you know, I'd have to say that uh, biblical politics have slowed down this department for too long. Uh, you give the people God and the Bible and it leads to nothing but despair. Tell me, Hank, and what exactly would you change? Would you do away with evolution and the empirical sciences and replace our textbooks with what, Bibles? Well, that's just my point. Parts of the evolutionary model are neither empirical nor good science. Evolution as it stands describes genetic changes in an organism from generation to generation. I have no problem with that. In fact, that type of testing is verifiable. And? And the mechanisms of these changes are said to be natural selection, genetic drift, and mutations. So what's the problem? The problem is macroevolution. Look, in our textbooks we're told that whales evolved from some hyena-like mammal, humans from apes, birds from reptiles. These conclusions are not based on any verifiable testing, but are speculations based on inferred similarities in the fossils of these creatures, some of which we have on display in the very halls of this building. What's your point? Well, for one, natural selection isn't enough to prove that that type of evolution has occurred. By definition, it is nature, choosing existing organisms to survive, not nature evolving existing organisms. And where we do have DNA, we can only prove distinction, not transition. Finally, there is no scientific test that observes a series of mutations that lead to macroevolution. Mm. That part is all speculation and guesswork. All methods are either silent on the subject of evolution, or they scream contradiction. You can't claim natural selection and mutation as the testable mechanisms of evolution and use paleontology as your proof. It's a sleight of hand that evolutionists pull, but Christianity has always been skeptical when it comes to evolution. Hello. Hi. Can I show you something? Okay. Two hours and 45 minutes a week. That's all the time we have with your children. How can anyone expect us to teach them in two hours and 45 minutes what it took historians thousands of years to accumulate? That is an almost impossible task. What we can do in two hours and 45 minutes is point them in what we believe is the right direction introduce them to the secular world and influence them. Yes, influence them. Two hours and 45 minutes may not be enough time to teach them much, but it is more than enough time to influence your sons and your daughters. Today was amazing. And it was everything I imagined. <laughs> hey, how my two favorite girls? Daddy! <laughs> hey, sweetheart. How are you doing, college girl? <laughs> hey, baby. Hey, hey, sweetheart. How are you? Good. Good. Something smells good. What do we have for dinner? Grilled salmon. Oh, well, you know what the Bible says. You find it a good wife. Find it a good thing? No, find it a good cook. Oh.
<laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, I see we're having cake. Yes. What are we celebrating? We are celebrating Joy's first day at college. She's already said it was amazing. Amazing. Well, why don't you tell us about this amazing day? Well, you know how some people might say, I have good news for you, but I also have bad news for you. Yeah, I've heard that before. Uh, why don't you tell us the bad news? Okay. So it's not exactly what they said. It's more of how they said it. Does that make sense? No, not really. They were saying things like, Jesus doesn't exist. Christianity is a big lie. It's a big hoax. What? Okay, well, they're just kids. They didn't grow up in a household where they were devoted to God and the scriptures like we are. Maybe they just don't know. That's the thing, it wasn't the kids, it was my professor who was saying those things. Well, tomorrow, you're gonna go down there and drop that class. We're not gonna pay a college thousands of our hard-earned dollars in tuition to teach our children that God doesn't exist. I, I just wish I would have been more confident when I was in class. And the professor was saying all these things and he seemed like he had all the answers. He seemed like he did. I don't know, I feel like I let Jesus down today. I mean, what would you want me to say when someone says that God doesn't exist? Oh, sweetheart, I can see how that can be intimidating. I just don't want it to hurt my grade. Is that, is that a bad thing? Well, I'll tell you what you can tell. I mm -hmm. am dropping mm -hmm. this class. Dad, <laughs> I'm not a kid anymore. How am I supposed to learn how to deal with all these challenges that will come up in my life if... I run away from this one. We are proud of you. I just wish there was something more we could do to be of help. Times are changing fast. Today, it seems like everything is about what you can prove. Joy, you shared your faith with others your entire life. And like you've always proclaimed, with your last breath. With my last breath, one more soul will find their way. Why don't you just shoot for a B and, and, and let your light shine? When your father and I were young, our world challenged us to be good Christians. Your world wants answers. You may very well be the only answer in this man's life. You know, sweetheart, as hard as it is to hear this and then know that you have to go through it, your mother is right. So what was the good news? I still believe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a good thing. Cheers. <laughs> Hello? Hello, Melody. Dr. Foster. Oh, hi, Dr. Foster. I have the results here for Joy. All levels and tests are fine. Two additional years and counting, Dr. Foster. Thanks to God. In fact, she's doing so well that I'm thinking about reducing her medicine. Tell her to keep doing whatever it is she's doing to stay healthy. And at her next checkup, I will reduce her medicine and I will come to church with her. That girl is going to have the entire community coming to our church. You know, Melody, I think that that could be a good thing. I went to an art show on campus once and fell in love with one of the paintings that was on display. It so touched me that I stopped by every day after classes to see it. On the last day of the show, I met the artist and asked him how long it took him to paint it. He said three months. For three months, he would meet with his canvas just once a week and devote two or three hours a day to his masterpiece. Make no mistake about it, we instructors, each one of us, 
See students as incomplete products, a canvas, as it were, defined by name. And each one of us as teachers are looking for that one student we can influence. That will be our masterpiece. You're up next. Let me remind you that you all have five minutes to pitch your movie to us. And we, the producers, will question you after that to see if your movie is well thought out. If it is, we will decide if you get the funding, or in your case, a passing grade. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Agard, and my, my film today will be very blunt. My presentation will be also. Uh, the question before us today is, how do I, I get you, as investors, to reach into your pockets and, and give money to donate my film? Well, since we are being blunt, allow me to ask a, a straightforward question. What if a professor ridiculed a student because she did not believe in God? Separation of church and state. She has the right to believe or not. Uh, yes, but what if instructors like, like Ms. Lyons disrespected the young girl by not taking into account that what she was saying may be offensive to the student's secular beliefs? In health class, we had to be respectful when speaking about sexual orientation in case there was someone in class that had chosen an alternative lifestyle. The same should apply to students' religious beliefs. Well, since we're being blunt, I tell you right now, I would never support a film like that. Yeah, me either. It's too intolerant of other people's beliefs. In fact, I'd make a film the opposite. Students, he has five minutes for his presentation. Please let him finish. And by the way, neither I nor any of the other university professors would ever be so callous as to disrespect a student's sexual orientation or religious beliefs. And I must tell you, Mr. Agard, you are hanging yourself with this strategy both business-wise and academically. So you wouldn't support a film like that? No. 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 And you, ladies and gentlemen, would support and donate to a film that opposes religious intolerance in the educational system? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK. Well, let me tell you about my film. Hey, you got lucky in film study today. <laughs> Luck had nothing to do with it. And congratulations on yours. Maybe we could work together. Quiet, please. Thank you. Adam and Eve, story of creation. Noah's Ark. Not the true accounts. Uh, actually, they were borrowed, stolen, if you will, from ancient Babylonian sources. And Mr. Agard, uh, sorry, you probably won't want to hear this, but your word of God, the Christian Bible, a collection of myths, contradictions, even lies. That's absurd. And quite frankly, Professor, I'm surprised at your ignorance. I mean, you stand up there and spit speculations as if they're truths, when even in a court of law, you need two things for a conviction to stand. One, hard or circumstantial evidence, and two, motive. And you, sir, have provided neither. Motive. Uh, I'll give you motive. After the death of your very human savior, disciples didn't want to look bad. They had to give credence to their religion, so they made up the story of the resurrection. And you have historical records that prove that. No, you asked for motive, and I gave you motive. Are you a historian or the devil's advocate? I also ask for evidence, counsel. Well, and you'll have it. There is no contemporary document of Jesus in existence. 
and the extant copies were written long after his apparent life. Two, 300 years after his death. That's your evidence? Yes, it is. Then the devil has a poor lawyer. First of all, you're being purposely misleading and taking advantage of the fact that most of my fellow students don't know anything about the subject. Second, some scholars trace the New Testament writings back as early as 45 AD. And as far as the extant copies go, we have biblical copies such as P52 that date back to the middle of the second century. Some of these papyruses are argued to even be older than that, between 60 and 70 AD. Wrong. You're wrong. Okay. Let's say for argument's sakes that the extant copies date back to 300 AD, like you said. These are still copies of copies that have been in circulation for some time. We have second century church fathers such as Polycarp quoting from the New Testament writings. This means the original writing. Mr. Agard, what's your point? You're wasting our time. That's my point. I mean, you come across as this hard, callous man and act as if God owes you something. As a matter of fact, Professor, since I've been in this class, I don't even think I've seen you smile. Mr. Agard, at your age, I'm surprised. And, and at this point in the course, certainly you must concede that we live in a very cruel world. History shows that. And as we live in this very cruel world, it leaves us little to smile about. You know, I've found that these these things that make us smile, they have a hold on us. And as a result, they control us. When we lose these things, these things that make us smile, well, we lose a little bit of ourselves. And what's left? Pain. Pain. Pain and sorrow. So, Mr. Agard, I hope you're not too surprised that I don't try to smile too much. Students, come on. We can't be so naive. The world doesn't possess color, just existence. A rose, a, a rose doesn't know that it's red. The euphoria that we experience looking at these things, it's a creation of our mind. I look at history, the world of man, the world you claim your God has created. What colors do I see? How do they affect me? What's the color of war? What's the color of dying? Sickness, poverty, Human suffering. So, no God, no pain. Is that right, Professor? Mr. Agard. Call me Paul. Paul, spare me any therapy. I imagine since you are unwilling to look at history, we'll have to take a more practical approach. And what is that? Common sense. Students, does anyone here believe in the tooth fairy? Paul. No. Okay, great. Now that we've gotten Paul on the same page as the rest of us, let me ask you all a question. Why don't you believe in such things? Just like the resurrection, right, Professor? Well, there's a little more to it than that, but basically, you're right. There's a lot more to it than that. The reason why you don't believe in those things has nothing to do with logic is because they were created to entertain in human children. They were never presented as, as truths. The stories in the Bible are brought forth as historical accounts. So, do you believe in the Tooth Fairy? No. And why not? Because it's a children's story. But yet you believe in the story of Noah's Ark? Yes. I rest my case. Well, then allow me to cross-examine. Professor, do you believe that something can exist forever, that it can live eternally? 
What do you mean? Like the human soul? Whatever. Anything. <sighs> Paul, I know where you're going with this. And the answer is no. No, I don't. Everything has to die. There's nothing that lives forever. This idea that the human soul goes on eternally after we're gone, it's illogical. As illogical as the tooth fairy. So you don't believe? As I mentioned, that's illogical. Well, do you believe in the law of conservation? Yes, I do. The law of what? Go ahead. Tell them, Professor. Tell them what it is. The law of conservation states that neither energy or matter can be created or destroyed. It's, well, it's eternal. Yes. Things are not eternal and true because man understands them to be so. Things are eternal and true because God has made them so. But your bias blinds you from seeing this. So I'll ask you again, Professor. Do you believe that something can live forever, yes or no? You know what, Professor, don't even answer that question. I think we all would be better off to not listen to you and to read our Bibles instead. There, I rest my case. Mr. Agard. Call me Paul. No, I think Mr. Agard will do. I think we've had enough of your Christian fanaticism, and seeing as I still have a class to teach, we'll need to move on. Hey, you sure don't give up, do you, bro? <laughs> I'm just protecting our First Amendment rights. You know, schools and colleges like this, they get government funding, and yet they belittle religion and are insensitive to people's personal beliefs. It's ridiculous. Just let him teach his class, man. Hey, you're in my history class, right? Yes. Okay, are you a person of faith? Yes, I, yes, I'm a Christian. <laughs> All right, what do you think about Professor Burns' class? He's a very knowledgeable man. I didn't ask you that. Uncomfortable. His, his teaching makes me feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. Well, I stand corrected. I'm protecting our First Amendment rights. Thank you. No, thank you. Why are you doing this? Tell me what you want us to do. Show me what you want us to do. We don't want this man in our life. What do you want? So students, as we've learned, in ancient cultures, the concept of God has strictly been a human construct. You mean man-made God? Correct. And this human construct takes on different forms as we move from culture to culture. Take the Persian god Mithra, for example. Shepherds were said to be present at his virgin birth. Sound like anyone familiar? Jesus? Precisely. Now, how about the Egyptian god Horus? He enjoyed the title Son of God and was even said to have been resurrected. Again, who does this sound like? Let me guess, Jesus? <laughs> you know what, Professor? You need to study logic. There are laws of inference that allow us to draw the proper conclusion based on two pieces of data. He's manipulating you. He's presenting information that you're not familiar with in a way that implies that Jesus was a fictional character. Mithra was born of a rock, not of a woman. 
So unless rock is a metaphor for his mother having a heart of stone, there goes your virgin story. And the account of the shepherds being president of his birth date back to the second century A.D. Excuse me, C.E. This lets us know that they were influenced by Christianity, not the other way around. Mr. Agard, I understand that it scares you to be told that God doesn't exist, that he's nothing more than a creation of people like you and I. No. Teachers like you scare me because you have no respect for the subject of God. As a historian, how can I have respect for history's greatest phantom? Phantom? God is a phantom? So, Professor, you're saying that God is not in history, but what about all the crazy religions and practices we've been reading about lately? God does not exist in history. The concept of God does, and therefore, all of these deities. And in that context, he's history's greatest phantom, taking on new forms and identities as he moves from religion to religion. Each culture forming God in their own image to suit their own needs. For example, the Egyptian gods are in the likeness of Egyptians and, and their animals. The same thing applies to Hindu gods and each culture borrowed from one another as they interacted. They created hybrids of gods and religions. Unfortunately, some people who take the Bible quite literally are skeptical of science because science tends to show that their religion is, well, little more than a security blanket. Are you teaching us in this class that God does not exist? Scientific evidence does not support the existence of God, nor is there any evidence in history for the existence of God. So draw your own conclusions. Hello, Frankie. Hey, Joy. So nice of you to join us real people. You lost or something? No, but you might be. Looks like someone has chosen a side again. Anyway, who are your friends? Well, this is Nia, and this is Samantha. Ladies, this is Deb. She's an agnostic, which means she doesn't know if there is a god, but I'm working on her. Hey, girls. Uh, let me introduce you to uh, Danny's baby. He's a great guy, just not big on commitment. Hmm. Well, God can change Danny's heart, and I'll pray for your baby, for its health and everything. Aren't those genes a bit restrictive in your condition? I'm not going to keep it. Oh, it? You mean her, right? Excuse me? Well, you're giving birth to a person, so your baby's not an it. How do you know that it, or she's a girl? When she decides to get rid of it, I, her friend, not Danny, will be there to support her. Anyway, we were just discussing the inaccuracy of the Bible. Care to join us? Smoke? Oh, she won't take it. Well, I don't see you smoking. No, it's bad for your health, but Joy won't take it because she's a Christian. I'll smoke if I want to. Joy Marie Hunter. Will you now? We've well, got to go. Come on, Joy. You ladies seem tense. You look like you could use some romance in your life. Ever considered dating an atheist? <laughs> the Bible is the word of God, you know. It's not what we were taught. Have you ever considered the fact that you might be taught wrong? You want to bet? I can prove it right now that that book was not inspired. Joy, let's go. <laughs> no, Mia, I want to finish this. If I can? No more Jesus jokes the rest of the semester. I'll stay quiet. Okay, yeah, fine, prove it. But if I win, then the atheist gets a kiss. No way. You scared? No. Prove it. Okay, in my literature class, we learned about something called documentary hypothesis. Ever heard of it? No. It's a theory that states Moses did not write the Pentateuch. 
but rather it was the collective work of four different authors. That's not right. It was put forth by a German named uh, Wellhausen or something. Yeah, he was one of your biblical scholars. Mm -hmm. That's a theory, so you haven't proven anything. Okay. In Genesis 1, what did God create last? Man. And yet, in Genesis 2, why does it say, and I quote, God did not create the fields, nor the plants, but first created man. End quote. The reason? Two different stories, two different authors. Jerk, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, hey, not so fast. Where's my kiss? You said you wanted a kiss. You never said from him. Hey, guys, you go along. I'm gonna go to the library. Bye. Daddy, would you like some more tea, Mr. Bear? Hey, hon. I'm going to the store right now. I'll be back later, okay? Hey, Emily? Okay, Emily. I'm going to go see what Fate's up to. What's going on in here? I smell something good. Oh, hi, Daddy. Are we having a tea party? Would you like some more tea, Mr. Bear? Daddy, my head hurts. Babe, babe, I need you to stay with me, babe. Babe? Just, uh, I took the rest of the day off, and um, it's slow, so they'll cover for me. And it's all right. What's going on? Uh, well, if you mean besides the cold shoulder we're continuously getting from our daughter, and the bad dream I had last night is... You had a dream? Why didn't you tell me you had a dream? I'm not an Old Testament prophet, sweetheart. It's just, just a silly dream. Just a silly dream, and yet you took the day off? Yeah. Well, in my dream, there's, there's a nest in the tree in the front yard, and um, there's a baby bird in it. And this large bird just swoops in and grabs the baby bird from the nest and flies away. That's it. That's all. That's enough. Where were the parents? <laughs> yeah, they're... And no parents, no sign of God, or, uh, nothing good at all. Well, I mean, except for this big sturdy tree. Last night, Pastor Rogers told me... What? He said that he was concerned about the girls. 
that for the past 10 years, he's been rethinking the importance of college as a means to get a job. Really? I've just never heard anyone say that before. Professor, if God does not exist, then where did we come from? Well, science has answers for that, Frank. Uh, evolution says that... You're a monkey. What did you call me? Mr. Agar, you're out of line. Are you offended, Professor? Yeah, uh, I would tend to be offended if you're calling someone a monkey. You have no right to say that. Well, then think about how I and others in this class must feel when you teach that we come from one. <sighs> so, evolution scares you. Well, maybe it should scare you. Consider this uh, science as big brother telling the church that it finally needs to let go of the security blanket. What about you, Professor? Are you afraid to believe or is it my faith that scares you? Because in your heart, you want to believe but just can't. The fact is, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in God. Evolution isn't monkeys trying to become man, it's man attempting to become monkeys. Again, Mr. Agard, you are absent any factual statement. Instead of your coy remarks, it would be nice if you would provide them once in a while. I have some news for you. When it comes to science, the theory of evolution comes as close to fact as you are going to see. Is that so? I bet most of you don't even know what evolution is, do you? No. But you believe in it. Yes. He wouldn't teach us anything that's not true. Isn't that right, Professor? Hmm. Evolution is... Well, Professor? Evolution is a successive progression, modifications, if you will, in an organism over an extended period of time. And to support that fact, they have taken great apes and taught them how to speak English. Get out of here, Professor. Is that true? It is true. Look up Coco.org. This is ridiculous. And just how long will it take for Coco to become human? He said it's a long time, right? Weren't you listening? You know what? Why don't you check back with Coco in a million years? Exactly. Hey, wait. We see mutations in animals all the time. Scientists even have a fly with an extra pair of wings, but none of these mutations are in favor of macroevolution. They usually end in disease and work against the animal survival. Well, a mutation in an ape named Lucy caused her to be bipedal and eventually human. Scientists even found 3.5 million year old footprints of these apes walking upright. That's right. Since this class began, I've been doing my research. Oh yeah? Well, the scientists that found the footprints, as well as the expert who analyzed them, said they were human. I've been doing my research before entering this class. It doesn't too. matter. They're in the textbooks as belonging to apes, and it's proof of evolution by way of mutation. Mutation does not work like that. Even if a mutation could cause an animal to walk upright, subsequent mutations could not turn it or its offspring into a man. And how do you know that? Who told you? Juan Herrera, biology major, pre-med, amigo. My man, thank you, Mr. Herrera. And there are other flaws in the evolutionary theory, such as the lack of transitional forms in the fossil records. Scientists have found a number of fossils they believe to be transitional. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And the best example of this is a whale, in which they have found three probable intermediate- Wait, 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 three? Three probable intermediate forms? Mr. Agard. There's anywhere between 10 to 100 million species of animals in the world today. And according to evolutionists, each having evolved over millions of years, if each species had just two transitional forms, there should be countless transitional forms. But instead, the fossil record across the board is silent. Why does Burns give this guy so much time? If not evolution, then how do you explain the existence of life? Intelligent design. 
Mr. Agard, I have a problem with Christians constantly pushing intelligent design on all of us. It's just a refried version of the creation myth. In science, things must be falsifiable. That is, they must have some way for them to be disproven. The Bible has nothing like that. The myths in the Bible do not hold up under scientific scrutiny. And Mr. Agard, there is an invisible line at the foot of my desk. Please, don't cross it again. Well, in an attempt to remove its discrepancies, the theory of evolution has evolved. Okay, this I gotta hear. The discovery of DNA has changed everything. Originally, scientists believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics, but this was proven wrong. Next up was Darwin's natural selection as a mechanism of, of evolution, but this was also not accurate. Today, Hereditary or germline mutations in the sex cells of the parents are said to be the primary mechanism of evolution in which natural selection acts upon. I don't get it. DNA is still within the animal, right? So if the animal adapts... DNA does not adapt. It replicates, and by a very specific process. Yes, that which the parent was, the child shall be. Monkey begets monkey, and man begets man just like the Bible says. Well, pardon the expression, thank God that we don't have just religion to answer our questions. Today, we emphasize evolution, not creationism. And, wrong again. We stress evolution in our classrooms today because of the Cold War, 1957. The Soviets launched Sputnik and America got nervous. We felt we were falling behind in the area of science, so our government funded the National Science Foundation, which came up with a secular curriculum to be taught in our classrooms. Inter-evolution. It made its way into our classes because of political competition, not because it was scientifically true. Is that true, Professor? And in 1987, the Supreme Court deemed teaching creation unconstitutional and it was removed from our classrooms. Christian parents and students never stood a chance. The monkey had won. Well, it seems like the monkey has gotten the better of you, Mr. Agard. Well, let's have an open debate. Student versus professor, man versus monkey. You represent Coco the gorilla and evolution. And I will represent God in intelligent design. Maybe when you get a PhD, Mr. Agard, and have a classroom of your own, then I might entertain the idea of having an open debate. But this is still my classroom. I am still the teacher. And with all due respect, Mr. Agard, you are just a student attempting to get their associate's degree. But I do have a question for you, a question that has long been asked by historians and philosophers. And what is that? Throughout history, there has been one constant, suffering. Yes, and? And Christianity that purports God, the creator of the world and sustainer of it, all knowing, all powerful, this God of the Bible, he seems to disappoint when it comes to suffering. Why would a God of this kind of power persist in allowing suffering? I, I don't understand, Professor. What, what do you mean? It's the age-old question of man, the problem of suffering. If God exists, he's omniscient, omnipotent, perfectly good. Yes. Second, if God is omniscient, omnipotent, and perfectly good, then suffering should not exist. Yes. Suffering does exist. Yes. Conclusion, God does not exist. The problem, Professor, is that you are a subjective creature trying to understand a transcendent God. You are the limited grasping at the limitless. At best, your conclusions will end in error. At worst, 
your conclusions will end in despair. Because he's an arrogant, pompous undergraduate. Who are you talking about? The Apostle Paul, of course. The Apostle Paul? No. A student in my class, his name is Paul. He had the audacity to challenge me, a university professor, to a debate on intelligent design and evolution. Oh, I'd like to crack at him. Mm. Jim, don't you teach ancient history? Yes, I do. Well, where did evolution come from? Jim, <laughs> I warned you about this. If you have a problem with God and Christianity, the classroom is not the place for it. Look, I don't need any more of your Christian babble, all right? No, by all means, let the Christian babble. Sounds like an eventful day. <laughs> what else happened? Well, I had a student bolt out of my classroom. For what reason? I don't know. She just took off, I guess. Her parents will have to deal with her when she gets home. No need to worry, Jim. The latest polls say that 75% of all college students reject the Bible as the Word of God. What are you getting at, Jerry? Look around this campus. By the end of this school year, three out of every four students will no longer be controlled by your God. Things are working out just fine. Each time a teacher meets with a student, he attempts to make that child see the world differently through his eyes. It is truly a subconscious effort, I assure you, and most teachers will deny this. But that a teacher imprints his or her views on a student is a truth nonetheless. The world is filled with war, death, and cruelty, and history proves it. This, or some thesis statement, I always gave to my students as an introduction. The very first day of class, not because it's how I viewed history, but because it's how I viewed the world. Look at the world now, John Hunter. Do you see it? Look closer. Beyond kindness. Look. You'll see it. In his eyes. There it is. Despair. You never saw the world this way before. I didn't change the world. I just changed how you saw it. It's within the power of an educator to change the way a student views the world. But it is not his charge. Frankie? Joy? Hey, Mel? Yes, babe? Where is Joy? It's getting kind of late. She's never late for dinner. What are you doing here? You're really not supposed to be here. She had that history class today, Dwayne. You know, the one with that Professor Burns. Yeah, you know, if he doesn't stop pressuring Joy, he and I are gonna have some real problems. So, Gilbert, this is how it's gonna be. Two against one. It looks like two to me. This is just between you and me. She's not a part of this. She was just leaving. You got my money? Just one more week, Frankie. The answer is no, basically. You stay out of this. I'm out here. God would never let our little girl lose faith. Would he? Oh, no. You guys take a stop. Joy starts college, and these are the type of questions we begin asking ourselves. And she's his student. I just hope he doesn't go too far with his views. Well, I hope you're right. But I'm starting to see the effects of this class. Joy? Joy? What's wrong? Nothing. Baby, what's wrong? 
It's nothing, Mom. I don't want to talk. I, I just want to go to my room. Wait, wait, wait. You don't want to talk? Dad, just let me go to my room. It was that class today, wasn't it? You know what? I knew it. You should have never... What? Never should have what? Lived this long? Gone to college? Taken history? Asked you questions that you can't even answer? You know what? I'm going to my room. Joy, stop. What? Girl, what has gotten into you? The truth. The truth? What truth? Whose truth? The truth they teach in schools. The world's truth. They teach it in textbooks about God, the Bible, Jesus. What, what, what could they possibly teach you about Jesus? That he doesn't exist. What? Dad, you're hurting me. I'm sorry. I just feel like I've been living a lie that you and Mom have perpetuated. All my life I've suffered, and I've always believed in a God that was bigger than my pain, that watched over me. And even though I didn't understand why I was sick, I, I always knew that God loved me and that my life still had some type of purpose or some meaning. And today I learned that, that he doesn't exist, and, and I, I don't have to be mad at him. Today, I learned Daddy that, that he's a phantom. And I've put my trust into something that was never even there. Do you know what that means? Do you have an answer for that? Joy. Do you have an answer for me? I didn't think so. Joy. They just don't understand. They don't know what I've learned. Gosh. What will happen to me now? I never doubted you. I've always believed. Now I'm just scared. If you just answer me this one time. One time, I promise I will never, ever, ever doubt again. You, do, you, you don't exist. That's why you won't answer me. You don't exist. Oh, I feel like I'm talking to myself. Professor? Yes, Joy? Um, I've had a lot of questions lately and I was wondering if you could, um... Well, yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, that's what we educators are here for. Uh, my office hours are Tuesday, 1 to 5. Uh, but, you know, my next class is watching a film. Uh, they're probably just going to be doing an assignment on that. I... I suppose we could meet now. Uh, people of faith might call it a divine appointment. Uh, so, what? How can I help you? Um. Well, that's that's just it. That's. What? What? Well, my faith. What about your faith? It, it's okay. Go ahead, just say it. Well, I, I've had a lot of questions about Jesus and the Bible and, and, and suffering.
My dear, here's some tissues, or any more tears, and a cup of tea to warm your spirits. Thank you so much for coming, Sarah. I'm so sorry. I, I'm really embarrassed. I, I didn't mean- Nonsense. Miss Hunter, regardless of what Mr. Agard's assessment of me is, I'm really quite human. May I? The answer is T. T. Yes, T. I've offered you this cup of tea to lift your spirits, which I see you haven't touched yet. Well, Joy, if you want to hold on to what I'm offering you, the tea, you're going to have to be willing to drop what you're holding on to, your cross, or religious beliefs that are stopping you from getting the answers to these questions that are troubling you. Do you know the origin of this trinket? Well, yeah, my mom gave it to me when I was a child. I was really sick at the time, and I was scared, and that night something happened. I mean, it's it, it's really dear to me. Well, that's a sweet story, Joy, but I didn't mean personal significance. I was talking about its historical origin. Do, do you know it? Well, it's Christian, right? Not quite. It's Roman, but it has come to be identified with Christianity. Here, here you go. It really means a lot to me, Professor. Yes, I'm sure it does. It's like we talked about in class. Sometimes people place too much significance on a thing, like religion. It makes them smile, makes them feel good, gives them hope. But it comes with a price. We become bound by it. And when life demands that we move on, we find we can't. And it's trinkets like this that keep pulling us back. Joy, I've got something for you. What is it? A book. But don't let the title frighten you. The important thing is, the author's trying to explain the philosophy of religion. Man's fundamental desire to create divine sources of comfort. It helps us make sense of the world. We create religious belief systems, assign gods, and put them on top of it. We take our own virtues and prejudices and assign them to stone and metal trinkets like the one you're holding in your hand. It's not surprising they become priceless to us. But in reality, it has no value at all. I know it's a lot to absorb at one time, but how do you feel? I don't know. I, I, I feel pretty upset. Upset? Why? For not even knowing what I believe and for even believing it. I feel like I'm a child again. And like you were saying in class a few weeks ago, I mean, I was one of the last kids to stop believing in Santa Claus. <laughs> you tell. Well, my friends would always make fun of me about it, and one year I got so mad that on Christmas Eve, when I went to put out Santa Claus's cookies, I also left a note that said, Dear Santa, don't touch. These are for the Tooth Fairy. <laughs> Professor, you're smiling. Yes, Joy, you seem to have that effect on me. I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing. Well, I think it's a good thing. You have a nice smile. <laughs> the Tooth Fairy, really, Joy? I know. I, I was a kid. You, you know, I'm feeling a lot better now. Thank you so much. Answers to our questions usually have that effect on people. I must admit, you've made me feel a little better as well. So, the illusion of God, huh? Yes. And tomorrow, why don't we meet back here and we'll have our next session.
we've reached the point in the class where we're going to be talking about the Greeks and their culture. Uh, there's a lot of things that are interesting about Greece. Probably the most interesting thing is that they began to look at their world uh, without the existence of God. Now, it's not that they didn't have gods. Uh, they did, plenty of them. Uh, this was something they had a very, very long tradition of. However, at one point, they began to ask the question, why should we be looking at our world through deity, which we could not see, but rather through the eyes of man? Uh, for example, uh, take uh, Homer in 850 BCE. He invited a goddess to introduce the Iliad. But by the 5th century BCE, the historian Herodotus began to interpret historical events through human eyes. Quite different. Now, I just want you to consider for a second. You don't have to believe this. Just consider. Take yourself, perhaps outside of yourself for a second, and consider the concept of a world without God. Hello? Melody? Dr. Foster. Hello, doctor. Is Joy at home? No, Joy's still at school. I'm concerned. Some of her levels are off, and that's not very good news. Um, that's why I'm curious as to if she's doing something different in her life. She started college a few months ago. That's a big milestone for us maybe a little bit too big. What do you think? Some things are different. I suspected so. What's this? It's a gift. Thank you, Joy, but uh, it's, it's generally regarded as inappropriate when students get teachers' gifts. Well, what about a gift from a friend? Pardon me? Well, can't you accept a gift from a friend? I mean, you were my friend last week when I was sad. You started it. You're smiling again. You've been doing that a lot lately. Yeah, well, don't tell anybody. I've got a reputation to uphold. Here you go, guys. Oh, nice tie. Is that a church tie? Uh, no, I won't be wearing it to church anytime soon. That's not the reason that I got it for you. Where's your faith, man? Uh, that'll be... That'll be all, thank you. Sorry, guys. Where's my faith? <laughs> Don't mind him. People lose things all the time. I used to ask myself the same question. What, what question? Where's my faith? Faith, my daughter. I miss her so. When I used to come home from school, frustrated, tired, she would get out her little miniature tea set and fix me a make-believe cup of tea. That's the last thing we ever did together. Well, let's get started. How's your week been going? Hey, I hope you're hungry. A little bit. Here you go. My, you sure have a lot of homework. Well, um, I, I have a lot of homework. Oh, so. it's okay, sweetie. I, I know. You know, we pray and we pray for our little girl, but sometimes we have to be proactive. And don't you think God wants us to be this way with our children? I do, but you know, this is as much our struggle as it is hers. I don't know. Yes, babe. Is it wrong to wonder how it's all gonna turn out? No, it's not wrong to wonder. It's only wrong to worry. How's this gonna work, Mel? Not only does the professor need God, 
but the very one that can help to deliver the truth to this man. Needs God also. What is it, Dwayne? I feel like I've asked God to do the impossible. And what's that? To help me to have compassion for this man. Hi, Joy. Hi, Professor. You know, you don't look so good. Well, I'm feeling a little sick, but, but I'm fine. You sure? Yeah, yeah. Well, what are you thinking about? Life, death, family. I mean, lately, my family life has been an absolute mess. I've never seen my mom cry so much in my entire life. And if there's no God, what does it even matter? Joy, I'm worried about you. <laughs> you don't look well. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. We always talk about me. Well, that's easy to explain. I, I'm nowhere near as interesting a subject <laughs> as you are. I'm a subject, right? <laughs> Really, though, what do you think about dying, about family, just about life? Well, families are great if you got them. That doesn't answer the question, Professor. Well, remember what I taught you in class. If you want to get a specific answer, you have to ask the right question. Well, whatever happened to your daughter, your marriage, your family? Well, you know, Joy, there's a dynamic that exists between a parent and a child. It's beyond words, but it's not beyond expression. You know, it's a spiritual connection where the well-being of the parent depends upon the safety of the child. It's what the mind does to compensate the heart when we're not in the presence of our children. We think about them and we feel safe, but when they're taken from us without justification, those thoughts turn to memories and those memories are too painful to bear. Her name was Faith and she was the prettiest thing the world ever saw. When she died, a part of me died with her. And then my marriage broke up. Joy, I was a believer at one time. Strange combination, God and I, huh? Joy, Joy! Joey Hunter, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Hunter, you you can't go in there right now. What are you talking Why? about? Why? What's wrong? Oh God! No, no, no! no, no, no it's no. not that, Mrs. Hunter. It's just that she left specific instructions that she doesn't want to see you. What are you talking about? That's our daughter. Specific instructions? She's only seventeen. How can she leave instructions? Okay, look. We plan to go and see her. Uh, Doctor Foster. Dwayne, Melody. Doctor, we need to see Joy. Joy was frantic when she came in, and then she passed out. We've stabilized her, but we need her calm. 
And if you go in there now... Uh, Professor Burns is in the office for now. What? A friend of the family, yes? Uh, she requested him. Of course, Doctor. He may be able to help settle her down. Professor Burns, uh, why? I know you want to see your daughter, but please, for her sake, give her some time. Mrs. Hunter, uh, Mr. Hunter. I've got a patient, so I need to develop. Uh, I'm Joy's professor, uh, Jim Burns. Yes, we know. We've heard a lot about you. All bad? All bad. Well, uh, I just want to let you know what happened. Uh, Joy and I were sitting out on campus talking, and Hold all of a sudden you were fainted. sitting on campus with my daughter. Why? What, I, excuse me. I just thought you'd want to know what the doctor had to say about her condition. Mr. Burns, she's been our daughter for 17 years. We know what Joy's condition is. Look, I know you're upset. I can understand that. I, I wish I could. There's something I could do. Honestly. We're her parents. Have you no respect for the things of God, Mr. Burns? For nine months I carried that child. Nine months. I loved her unconditionally before she was born. Even before she had the awareness to know that I exist, I loved her. And in three months, three hours a week, you have seemingly destroyed all that. For five years straight, after she was born, she was sick, constantly. I prayed with her in a day when she suffered. We carried her back and forth to the hospital, slept in that room with her. We watched with her all night when she was afraid to go to sleep. And in three months, three days a week, you have seemingly destroyed all of that. For 17 years, we went to church as a family, prayed, worshiped, laughed, and cried. And in three months, you've destroyed that. We've been closed for 17 years, and now I can't even go in to see her. You took our daughter from us. How do you expect us to feel about you? Hey, you are a wonderful mother. Thank you. We'll stay here. We'll stay here as long as she needs us. Yes, we will. Call doctor to the ER. Hey, doctor, could I have a word with you? What's on your mind, Mr. Barnes? How's she doing? Her vitals are dropping. Is she dying? Yes, but she shouldn't be. It's a bit complicated. Joy has a rare condition. In the past, we've been able to control it, but this time there's something different. We're doing all that we can, though, to medically help her through this in any way possible. Well, what's, what, what's different? Mr. Burns, Professor, there's more to this world than what our eyes can see or even understand with our tiny little brains, and that's coming from a medical doctor. What? You're telling me you went to eight years of medical school, and that's all you've got to say? Mr. Burns, her body's not sick. Believe it or not, she's dying because her soul is sick. Her soul is sick? Why is her soul sick? She's not fighting anymore. She's lost the will to live. She has all the signs of depression, and that's causing other complications. And her body is responding in kind. Do you know why she's depressed, Professor? I understand you're the one with all the answers here. How do we treat that? What's gonna happen to me? What are, what are you doing here? I'm, I'm sorry, Joy. They said that you asked for me, that you wanted me to be here. No, 
What are you doing here? I'm dying. No, 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 no. Joy, you're, you're not dying. You don't have to die. What does it matter, right? It's kind of funny. What's funny, Joy? What brought us together? What did bring us together? Faith. Faith. Let me get that for you. There. Life is painful, Professor. I believe that. The world is filled with war, death, and cruelty. And history proves it. Welcome to college. I've searched my whole life for the answer to that question. Why do people have to suffer? Now, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to live long enough to... I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to find the answer to that in my life either, Joy. But you have all the answers. You always do. You stop smiling. Well, I can't lose you, Joy. Your parents, your mom, your dad, they can't lose you. You know, I saw them when I walked in here. I looked in their eyes. They love you. Joy, they should be in here. What if you needed them? What if you needed their help and you needed to call to them? Joy, they need to be here. They can't lose you. I've never heard you talk like this. For the first five years of your life, they took care of your every need, Joy. What? What, what I'm trying to say is that I will never love you the way that they do. They've given you everything. I've done nothing but take from you, Joy. Well, where are you going? I don't belong here, Joy. Professor, what's happening is real. Please, don't go. Joy, don't leave us. Professor, there was a young girl in the Bible who died, but Jesus assured her parents that she wasn't dead, but she was only asleep. I don't think that story is about her living or her dying. It's, it's telling us that God is in control of our lives. He was in control of her life, her parents' lives, and people who suffer, they have a purpose. And I think that her parents suffered more than she did. Don't you? Suffering is a path to humility. And and humility. It's the pathway to God. Joy, what about me? I've rejected, denied God repeatedly, purposely. I know exactly what he'd say. Why do you seek? The living I want the dead. I want the living God in my life because I don't have the answers. I need the living God back in my life. 
Choi, please forgive me. Joy? I, I forgive you. We questioned God in our suffering. And that's where you and I went wrong. In the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus merely asked if it was God's will. And it is. Yes. Time is up, it seems so clear. My eyes are open through my tears. Faith I doubted, my God knew. To my heart I would be true. My last breath I'm reaching out. One more soul to find his way. As I'm forgiven, I too forgive. Love revealed for eternity. I have the right to believe. To believe in love. A God-given right. To look above, to share the joy for something more, a loving God whom I adore. We want the freedom to believe, the freedom to believe in God. Happiness of living in a state of grace, I've been told. It's out of place The classroom's filled with doubt Is education what it's all about To live without my belief in God That my faith is a facade God set the world in motion Is it just an archaic notion? I have the right to believe To believe in love A God-given right To look above Share the joy for something more, a loving God whom I adore. We want the freedom to believe, the freedom to believe in God. Our family fathers gave us rights to choose belief in what we like. Happiness, liberty, and life To live in a world without strife We're sent to teach us in school Forget there's more than the golden rule Closing doors, open minds Call students to grow up blind I have the right to believe To believe in love A God-given right To look above Joy is found in the freedom to believe. Joy is found in the freedom to believe. I have the right to believe, to believe in love, a God given right to look above, to share the joy for something. Share the 
जो 